Hello everyone, myself Dr. Abhishek Kumar, welcome to lecture 17 of the course Applied Seismology for Engineers. In lecture 16, we had discussed about the solution when a shear wave is passing through a particular medium. So, we try to develop what will be the equation which will govern the motion primarily in terms of displacement which will be a function of space as well as time. Going to discuss about how the position of or how the displacement will change with respect to space with respect to time because of propagation of shear wave through a particular medium. Prior to lecture 16, in lecture 14 and 15 we discuss about the governing equation through which the primary and secondary wave will pass through the medium. In lecture 17, we try to develop the solution of that particular equation. So, equation remain one dimensional equation of motion for shear wave and subsequently the solution of it which was given in terms of u and u is the motion or the displacement component. In today's lecture, lecture 17, we will be discussing about a new term which is called as local side effect abbreviated as LSE and the methodology based on which local side effect can be quantified numerically which is also known as ground response analysis. So, basically lectures 17, 18, 19 and 20, four lectures collectively will give you an information about what is ground response analysis, why it is important particularly in terms of seismic aspects and how one can determine or quantify local side effect using available methodologies. Primarily, we will be focusing on numerical methods, more specifically about linear method, equivalent linear method and nonlinear methods, which are mainly focusing on one dimensional ground response analysis. So, introduction, we know whenever there is an earthquake, in case this is a recording station, one can get to know what will be the shaking characteristics of the ground with respect to time. It can be quantified in terms of displacement values, variation with respect to time, it can be quantified in terms of velocity values at the point of observation or the recording station, how that particular point is sensing ground vibration in terms of acceleration, velocity or displacement values which are primarily because of different kinds of wave passing through your observation point and whether it is a rotating drum coil or it is kind of piezoelectric sensor, it will sense the vibration and record it in terms of whether it is in terms of signature on rotating drum or in terms of the corresponding units. This is about the recording part of ground motion, which is very selective. So, depending upon if the recording station is there, you can access, you can record and you can access the ground motion properties from the recording station. But we know recording stations are not spread all across, those will be specific to some location, may be individual or a part of some seismic array. Again, some recording station will give you recordings corresponding to local earthquakes, some will give you corresponding to global earthquakes as well. What primarily will be witnessed in terms of an earthquake occurrence is, there will be damage to the buildings. It can be in terms of minor shaking, it, it can be in terms of cracks, it can be in terms of major cracks, it can be in terms of partial damage or complete collapse. So, majority of the time as a user of the society, what we witness during and after an earthquake is building damage and depending upon the response of the building to the ground shaking, often we also experience injuries to the user and worst scenario is casualties also. So, that means, one part is recording of the ground motion characteristics at your observation point, second part is the actual scenario which is going to be created because of earthquake and its interaction with the system it can be ground, it can be building, it can be any other kind of superstructure. Most often, we witness 
B means the user or who is living in a society or again uh, expert, B witness in terms of damages to the building and in terms of casualties. So, some of the damages you can say in terms of building damages, sometimes you can say in terms of excessive ground shaking, sometimes we can say in terms of landslides. If you go to hilly terrains, there will be landslide. If you go to uh, uh, ocean, there can be tsunamis because of earthquakes. Secondly, at times you can even have ground subsidence minor to major and depending upon the amount of ground subsidence which is witnessed at the site of interest, you can say if it is within tolerable limit or not. So, earthquake generated seismic waves transfer. So, there is a source if you try understanding the overall geometry of the problem, there is a source or the focus at which because of movement possible movement along the two parts of the fault block, there was building up of strain energy. When the strain corresponding built up of stresses exceeds the N C 2 strength of the material, the material will undergo failure. The, we are talking about the material which is available at the fault plane, which is actually coming into the picture when the two parts of the fault blocks are in contact with each other and experiencing shear this is happening at the source. So, the motion will continue as far as the material is able to withstand the or able to store the strain energy generated. Once the material undergoes failure, there will be development of seismic waves in all the direction with respect to the material. So, in three dimensional space waves have been generated from the focus and start propagating. Between the focus and the site, because generally when we report damages, it is not only confined to the epicentral distance, but even at times these damages will be reported at 100 kilometer, 200 kilometer, 300 kilometer away from the epicenter or more precisely the earth, uh, earthquake focus. So, that means we are witnessing the damages at 200, 100, 300 kilometer distance from your focus. We, we have just discussed about the waves which are generated at the focus. Once these waves start propagating through the crystal medium, primarily these waves will undergo change in motion characteristics or in its frequency content as its as the waves interact with the heterogeneity present in the medium. There will be scattering between the source and the site, which will be happening again in three dimensional space. Some energy will be lost in terms of particle motion, heat as a result of which what is observed as you are moving away from your source of an earthquake and going away in every possible direction, there will be change in the motion characteristics at each and every observation point, primarily because of heterogeneity, particle motion, heat, dissipation, scattering. So, this change first one is generated at the source. So, you are having some motion characteristic at the source. When this motion interacted with the propagation path between the source and the site, it kept on changing its characteristics. Finally, the motion reaches to the site. So, the second point tells about the earthquake generated seismic waves, which are actually propagating through a propagation path and reaching at the bedrock. So, if, if I am having a building located over here. and this is your ground level. So, directly the seismic wave will not hit this particular building, because this is primarily located on soil, but below this particular soil there will be rock medium depending upon the characteristics of that rock, we can we can even identify it as bed rock medium. So, primarily the incident wave which were propagating from the focus through the propagation path will be reaching the bedrock medium. Again depending upon the medium characteristic that means layer 1, layer, layer 2, layer 3. These are also if you remember the derivation for shear wave propagating through a particular medium, the medium will experience particle motion. If it is shear wave the medium will undergo shearing in perpendicular direction. So, such thing will happen 
in medium 3, medium 2, medium 1 or if there are 10, 15 kinds of layers in each of these layers this shearing will happen again. So, there was some incident motion which was modified already by propagation path again this motion will subsequently be modified by layer 3 depending upon its impedance layer 2 depending upon its impedance, layer 1 depending upon its impedance which we have already discussed in one dimensional equation of motion for shear wave and its subsequent solution. So, again if you see motion characteristics at this particular section, motion characteristics at this particular section, motion characteristics at this particular section and finally, at the ground surface at each of these levels the characteristics of same ground motion, same ground motion means the motion which was generated from the source and reached to your bedrock, the characteristics of that particular motion that means the frequency content, amplitude and the duration keep on changing as the motion is interacting with different different layers having different values of sh shear modulus, damping characteristics, Poisson's ratio, mass density. Finally, what will be the motion which will be subjected to your build building is not the motion which was actually reached to your site of interest through propagation path rather it will be now the modified motion modified by n number of layers. This particular modified motion which is now available at the ground surface is actually responsible in controlling the response of this particular building. So, if I am interested to find out how much is the expected level of seismic shaking for this particular building, I have to take not into account the motion at the bedrock, but the motion which has been modified by n number of layers and reaching to your ground surface. It is primarily because of this reason that we are taking into account this is called as local soil that means the soil which is available beneath the ground surface at your site of interest. If this is your site of interest this particular soil corresponding change in the motion characteristics will be assigned by local site effect. If this is not your site, site is again 10 kilometer, 15 kilometer away from this particular building then corresponding to that particular site whatever is the soil properties that will govern how much change in the bedrock characteristics of motion will happen as the motion reaches to the ground surface. So, corresponding to that particular site how much amplification, deamplification in the motion characteristics will happen that will decide corresponding to that 5 kilometer distant site from this particular site what will be the motion which will be actually induced by a particular earthquake generated at the source on that particular building. So, at times we see the motion will be amplified that means there will be increase in the amplitude of motion corresponding to bedrock at the surface and at times there will be deamplification also depending upon the relative characteristics of each of these layers. If there is change in the stiffness you can expect amplification or deamplification. Why it is important? Because it is finally the amplified or deamplified ground motion at the surface which is going to define how much this particular building will be subjected to seismic shaking or corresponding induced load because of particular earthquake which has happened at 100 kilometer, 150 kilometer, 200 kilometer away from your site of interest. Similarly, if the building is not there rather it is a soil medium, sandy soil is there and very high ground water table. We know sandy soil, high ground water table if it is subjected to seismic shaking that can also experience loss in its shear strength also known as liquefaction. So, again when we say it is losing the strength or subsequently there is building up of pore water pressure, it will not happen because of bedrock motion, but because of motion which is experienced at the surface because the soil is available at the surface. So, even loss of strength in the soil which is experienced during liquefaction will be also because of modified ground motion. Same way if you talk about excessive ground shaking where it is happening, it is happening at the ground surface. So, again 
modified ground motion. Ground subsidence where it is happening at the surface near the surface again modified ground motion. Landslide again at that particular site what is the characteristics of the slope? What are the characteristics of different layers available at the slope? That will define how much is the change in the medium characteristics because of local soil or the local material available at the site of interest. So, we have understood that motion reaches at the site at the bedrock level subsequently undergoes amplification deamplification such that there will be change in the medium characteristics as it reaches from bedrock to the surface. And finally, this is a surface motion which is going to control the response of your building available at the ground surface. If you are talking about underground structure, you have to correspondingly take what is the depth of that particular structure with respect to ground surface and then accordingly one can identify what motion whether it will be surface motion, bedrock motion or some other motion one has to take into account in order to consider how much will be the loading in terms of any underground structure. So, understanding this change in the ground motion characteristics because of local soil is called as local side effect. As I mentioned here, local side effect means the effect in ground motion which is primarily happening because of soil medium available near the ground surface at your site of interest. So, there are different ways one can quantify the local side effect. One is by means of numerically taking into account the solutions of the equation which we have done in lecture 16 and quantify how much change in the characteristics of the motion will be able to take place taking into account the natural frequency of the medium and the frequency content on of external loading condition. We will discuss these in coming slides and in lecture 18, 19, 20 also. So, ground motion again whatever I have been discussing so far in a nutshell we can understand through this particular slide. So, we are talking about ground motion primarily as far as the building damage, minimization of the building damage, casualty minimization ground subsidence, minimization, each of these things which are directly the function of modified ground motion at the surface. So, we have to correlate this with respect to what is happening at the source. So, if you consider this at the ground surface and this is your site of interest. Suppose here there was an earthquake as a result of the rupture which has taken place during that particular earthquake. So, this is the focus. As a result of this, there will be generation of seismic waves all around in the three dimensional space and this is a surface projection that is called as epicenter. So, this we have already discussed in earlier slides, epicentral distance, hypocentral distance. Of course, we are not taking the curvature into account over here. Now, if you go to particular site, there will be local soil available beneath the ground surface followed by bedrock medium. Sometime there will be weathered rock also, so you can take that accordingly into account. So, seismic wave generated at the focus will propagate through the propagation medium, finally reaching to the bedrock medium and when these motions are undergoing, these will undergo reflection, refraction as a result of which there will be change in the characteristics of the motion generated at the focus and at any point along the propagation path. Remember the focus and epicenter and the site can be 100, 200, 300 kilometer away from your uh, away from each other. Again if you see at the particular site the characteristics of the motion at three location one is at bedrock, second between the bedrock and local soil interface and the third one is finally at the ground surface. So, you can see all these three motions there is significant change in the ground motion characteristics. So, that means you cannot take bedrock into account and design a building because there will be change in the frequency content as well as amplitude. So, you will end up in underestimating the actual earthquake loading expected at your site of interest if you do not take into account local side effect properly. So, finally, the ground motion remains ground motion, but subsequently modified because of lot many characteristics. So, at the source depending upon the epicentral coordinate 
फोकल डेप्स फॉल्ट प्लेन सॉल्यूशन, रप्चर लेंथ रप्चर वेड़ डायरेक्टिविटी इफेक्ट ऑल दिस विल डिफाइन हाउ मच विल बी द मॉडिफिकेशन एट द सोर्स इट सेल्फ एंड फाइनली वॉट विल इज द ग्राउंड मोशन जनरेट एट द सोर्स प्रोपोगेशन पाथ दैट मीन्स बिटवीन द सोर्स एंड द साइड डिपेंडिंग अपॉन द स्ट्रेंथ कैरेक्टरिस्टिक्स डिपेंड अपॉन द फ्रीक्वेंसी कंटेंट एंड इट्स मॉडिफिकेशन डिपेंडिंग अपॉन द एटीनुएशन कैरेक्टरिस्टिक्स ऑफ द मोशन एट द अलॉन्ग द प्रोपोगेशन पाथ लास्ट पार्ट इज साइड कैरेक्टरिस्टिक्स वेदर रॉक इज देयर सॉइल इज देयर रॉक इज आउट क्रॉप और एक्सपोज टू द सर्फेस देन फ्रीक्वेंसी कंटेंट ऑफ बेड रॉक मोशन ऑल दिल ऑल दिस विल डिफाइन हाउ मच विल बी द एम्पलीफिकेशन इन द बेड रॉक कैरेक्टरिस्टिक्स ऑफ द मोशन एज रीचिंग टू द एनी पर्टिकुलर डेप्थ ऑफ द सॉइल एंड सब्सिक्वेंटली ऑन टू द ग्राउंड सर्फेस नाउ वी डिस्कस्ड अबाउट local side effect we discuss what is local side effect why it is called as local side effect why it is important can be understood from this particular slide which has been taken from kumar et al 2017 discussing about non linear ground response analysis for nepal so further details of this paper you can find out from my website now here one important part why ground response analysis quantification is important has been highlighted by means of what has been reported by different authors in terms of whether ground motion amplification whether in terms of significant building damages which were not only restricted to epicentral distance starting with 1985 michaukan earthquake so you can see the earthquake was of magnitude 8 correspondingly there was five times amplification even at 600 km radial distance from your site of interest that means whatever ground motion after amplification and deamplification would have reached at a bedrock that motion had experienced five times amplification so that means if you take bedrock motion and design your building you will be subjecting your building to 1/5 of expected motion certainly building will not remain safe secondly in 1989 loma prieta earthquake again 2 to 4 times amplification in san francisco bay area which was located almost 120 km away from your epicentral distance 1999 there was an earthquake in chamoli of magnitude 6.5 in uttarakhand region of india again you can see the vibration because of that earthquake were felt up to nepal pune and there was considerable damages to buildings in delhi and dehradun so again it this example is just to highlight that because of local side effect phenomena the damage is will not be confined only to epicentral region but even at larger distances again 26 january 2001 there was an earthquake in bhuj which triggered liquefaction to large scale you can see over here it caused liquefaction in udaipur located 50 km then lot of building damage is in amdavad which was located almost 350 km away from your epicentral or from focus again 2011 there was an earthquake in japan that those earthquake was of course it caused lot of liquefaction in maihama and tokaimura regions which were actually located 150 km epicentral distance away from your epicenter Then 2011 there was an earthquake in uh, Sikkim of magnitude 6.8, which caused lot of landslide in Mangan, Jorthang, Lachung, Chungthang area, which were again significantly distance away from the focus. Collectively, based on the slide which is shown over here, what I am trying to highlight is it's not that as you go away from your epicenter there will be reduction in the magnitude. Or, or the amplitude of the ground vibration so the overall objective of showing this particular slide is to highlight the importance of local soil because it can amplify even very low amplitude ground motion as a result even if you are talking about x motion which significantly lesser than the motion experienced in the epicentral region but this x can be amplified four time five times between the bedrock to the surface and based on this we can also see this four time five times amplification actually lead to 
liquefaction lead to building damages and many more things. So, not only one should be focusing only in the epicentral region, but even if your site of interest is located away from your epicentral distance, you have to take into account the local side effect, so that you can accurately estimate how much is the amplified ground motion at the ground surface. Now, historical significance is what we have just discussed depending upon the subsoil characteristics. Now, this modification of 4 time 5 time amplification in the ground motion because of local soil definitely will pose more load to the building and subsequently there will be more damages if the building has not taken the local side effect based modified ground motion in its design and construction. So, extent of damages can vary as a result of local side effect not only to the epicentral distance, but even to distant location. Some of the previous slide, some of the examples had experience damage even up to 200, 300, 600 kilometer away from your epicentral distance. Again large scale damages 1985 earthquake, 1989 earthquake we have already discussed. So, depending upon the impedance contrast like how much change in the stiffness of the medium that will define how much change in the amplification, deamplification will take place between two layers which are adjacent to each other uh, available in the stratification. So, I have mentioned about some of the earthquakes again you can see about many more earthquakes where the importance of local soil effect was highlighted in terms of amplified ground motion, building damages, liquefaction, landslide and many more induced effects. Again in Indian scenario we discuss about 99 Chamoli earthquake, we discuss about 2001 Bhuj earthquake, Sikkim earthquake. So, those also highlighted that even at larger distances there can be building damages primarily because of amplified ground motion. So, there is a need why it is important to understand local side effect because if you are not taking the local side effect or corresponding to that the amplified ground motion into account, there will be your building will be subjected to amplified ground motion not the motion which is available at the bedrock. And if the building is not designed for this amplified ground motion, certainly the building will undergo damages. There are intended users also, so depending upon the collapse of the building there can be casualties. Again if it is landslide prone region because of amplified ground motion the slope can undergo failure. So, in order to minimize such kind of building damages and subsequently casualties, one has to take into account how much quantification or how much change or modification in the bedrock motion because of local soil has happened in the past or how much it is possible in the near future because of potential earthquakes. So, the change in the ground motion characteristics due to the presence of local soil can be determined. It will help in developing how much will be the design response spectra for that particular site of interest. Corresponding to that one can take into account how much will the load on the building accordingly one can design the building and do the construction part of the building. That means, you know how much is the loading expected at the site of interest because you have taken that expected loading into account in your design and construction, your building remains safe and subsequently the intended users will also remain safe. It will also help in minimizing the induced effect such as liquefaction, landslide because now you have already quantified expected modified ground motion at those sites. So, that accordingly you can take appropriate measures because before and actual earthquake is going to hit your site of interest. If it is soft ground, you can actually improvise the stiffness of the ground before going for any kind of construction or any other utility uh, preparation. So, subsequently you can actually reduce even casualties not only the induced effects. Further induced effects such as ground settlement, liquefaction, can be controlled because now you are having the modified ground motion based information you can quantify those and then take suitable remedial measures. If the ground is soft you can go for ground improvement. If the building is not designed for that you can appropriately see if retrofitting of the building is possible then you can do that part. 
and subsequently other induced effects can be can be quantified well in advance and suitable measures which otherwise will be developing because of this induced effects. So, you can actually arrest those. Again site specific ground motion studies will help in quantifying local side effects and subsequently developing inputs for each of these available, uh, above mentioned parameters. So, local side effect as I mentioned over here from the source vibrations have propagated along the propagation path. Now, at the propagation path uh, once it reaches to the side there will be n number of layers and as you move from bedrock towards the surface in general the stiffness value will reduce. As a result, the though the, the, the wave at the bedrock level was incident at some angle, but we will see because of reduction in the stiffness value, the wave propagation will be almost vertical as you move from deeper layers to the shallower layers and subsequently to the ground surface. So, as, as mentioned in this particular figure, because of surficial layers which are available at the surface or near the surface, the, the wave propagation path will be almost vertical and keeping that understanding into account, that means propagation path is almost vertical that will lead to shearing in horizontal direction. So, we will take these understanding about propagation path, source effects and more prominently when we are discussing about local side effect, we will be taking into account the stratification characteristics and quantify the modified ground motion. So, knowledge of rupture at the source where the waves can be generated during a particular earthquake, knowledge of the propagation path through which the wave will be modified till it reaches the uh, bedrock at the site of interest and then knowledge of subsurface layer medium which will be further enhancing or modifying the ground motion before it is reaching to the ground surface. So, challenges here are we are interested to quantify local side effect, but we do not know what is the expected level of ground shaking during the design life of the structure. So, one has to quantify that also because that will tell how much is the expected level of ground shaking even at the bedrock level. So, there are some challenges that means collectively we are interested to find out what is more accurate ground motion which is actually going to be induced at bedrock level because subsequently once you have bedrock motion you can you have uh, uh, subsurface layer details and their corresponding stiffnesses you can quantify local side effect. Again the properties of propagation path one has to take it into account if you are going for completely region specific study. Otherwise if some site specific recordings are there you can take that into account and correspondingly modify them and go for local side effect quantification. So, seismic hazard analysis as we discussed in earlier classes that will help in quantifying the expected level of ground motion usually at bedrock level. We, we in seismic hazard analysis either we target for bedrock or we target for site class A condition depending upon the ground motion prediction equation which one has used in the seismic hazard analysis. After that, so this is giving going to give you the expected level of ground shaking at bedrock. After that, you will get the motions at the bedrock, use those motions at bedrock medium and then go for local side effect and modify this motion or quantify those motion and determine the expected level of ground shaking at the surface. So, modified or modification in the bedrock motion due to layers of soil which are available beneath the site of interest one has to deal with in ground response analysis. That means, when we talk about local side effect that is basically the phenomena or the effect which is primarily coming into picture because of local soil available beneath the ground surface. If you go with ground response analysis it is a measure of quantifying how much local side effect is possible at your site of interest for a corresponding motion and corresponding to local soils. I am telling in the beginning also and I will tell again repeatedly in lecture 18, 19, 20 also that whenever we quantify local side effect, it significantly 
depends on the motion which you have used at bedrock level. So, if you are using very high amplitude motion, generally it is seen the amplification in the because of local soil will be relatively low. If you are using very low motion, there will be lot of amplification because of local soil. This phenomena is governed by the dynamic properties of the soil, which we will discuss in coming classes. So, methods there are different methods based on which one can assess or quantify local side effect. Experimental method. So, this method utilizes ground vibrations in the form of ambient noise or passive sources which are already existing in your domain of interest. Take those into account and try to understand the ground characteristics as well as the change in those characteristics because of or, or the vibrations modification which are happening because of local soil characteristics. So, that is called as experimental methods. Then comes empirical methods, these evaluate the ground motion characteristics such as acceleration velocity and displacement values with respect to soil characteristics and then one can determine how much is the design response factor. Again one can refer to different codal provisions, where actually the value of different coefficients corresponding to particular site class have been defined. So, take those coefficient refer to that and you will be able to determine how much will be the modified displacement velocity or acceleration values at that particular site class because of a target input motion. Third one is semi empirical method, where you utilize ground motion from record and take site specific observations, which are you are determining from in situ experimental methods. Clubbing all these two, you will be able to determine the local side effect using semi empirical method. So, you are having experimental method, which is going to use completely in situ measurements. Empirical methods means based on codal provisions, coefficients are known to you. So, depending upon the site class, depending upon whether you are targeting for acceleration, velocity or displacement, you can pick up the coefficient and determine the design response factor. In semi empirical method, even the site property you are going to define based on ground motion regional records and then take that into account along with other properties of the site and quantify the local side effect. Next one is theoretical methods or sometimes these are also referred as numerical methods, where you will take into account the soil properties at the particular site of interest and the solution of one dimensional equation of motion for shear wave, which we have discussed in last class and see how the displacement changes between the base of a particular soil layer to the top of that particular soil layer and subsequently it follows. So, this can be quantified in terms of one dimensional space primarily when you are talking about local side effect, where the stratification is almost horizontal, surface itself is also there is not much change in the topography of the medium, you can go with 2D uh, uh, one dimensional ground response analysis. Subsequently, depending upon the change in the medium properties, you can also look into 2D and 3 dimensional ground response analysis. So, one has to take or refer to 2D and 3D wave propagation models. As far as this particular course is concerned, because we will be discussing about ground response analysis, we will be focusing on one dimensional ground response analysis in particular and hybrid methods, you can take into account long period vibration and correlate the characteristics of those vibration with respect to local soil properties. So, ground response analysis, as I mentioned theoretical method, we will be covering more in terms of ground response analysis. So, theoretical methods, we will be quantifying ground response analysis numerically primarily based on three methods. One is linear method, second is equivalent linear, third one is non-linear method. So, whenever we say linear equivalent linear or non-linear method, basically we are trying to understand the response of local soil, keeping the soil property to be constant, keeping the soil property to be a function of shear strain or co co corresponding to shear strain and thirdly, how with respect to the duration of loading, the change in the dynamic properties of the soil is taking place that we will quantify in non-linear analysis. So, there is significant difference between linear equivalent linear and non-linear analysis 
it will be more clear once you start discussing about each of these methods which we will try to cover in uh, coming classes again it will remain with one dimensional two dimensional three dimensional space so depending upon whether you are taking into account for a level or gently sloping ground quantifying local side effect based on one dimensional ground response analysis is it is going to give you relatively accurate value if there is sloping ground or irregular surfaces you can take into account two dimensional ground response analysis or wave propagation model again the three dimensional space if you are talking about some basin effect you can take into account the three dimensional ground response analysis so some important terminologies which we will be requiring throughout your ground response analysis why these are important because we are trying to understand local side effect which is the modification in the ground motion characteristics between the bedrock and the surface now there are two ways one is you have the bedrock motion known to you or if you have a sensor you have put at the base at the bedrock level at your site of interest and you are regularly monitoring it this generally does not happen because if you are going for recording you are not using at every site like if every site is used for construction not every site you will be putting a sensor and recording the motion even if you do so uh, do so the motion will be recorded during a particular earthquake so that motion you cannot utilize to quantify local side effect and incorporate those modification in your design and construction so the motions which are available existing motions which are available are mostly referred to as bedrock motion so one can refer to region specific seismic hazard analysis one can refer to regional ground motion records one can also refer to the damages which has happened in the past or historical earthquake induced ground vibration or intensity values and try to figure out what is most likely to be repeated ground motion at your site of interest that means if regional ground motion record for an earthquake which has been identified as most promising or more potential earthquake to your site of interest which can which can trigger significant seismic hazard at your site of interest certainly that motion you will take into account modified at your bedrock condition to the site of interest that means if i am targeting my site is potential to experience a motion of say point 1g this particular point 1g i am quantifying based on seismic hazard analysis but point 1g is just a quantity or a number which will be given from seismic hazard analysis in order to take or or, or to perform ground response analysis one has to have a complete understanding about the motion corresponding to which the peak ground acceleration is 0.1g so you can refer to regional ground motion records that will give you an understanding about generally what is the characteristics of ground motion in that particular region if regional records are not there one can refer to records which are there in larger distances finding out the similarity in terms of seismic hazard or seismic activity of the region of your interest and the other region in which ground motion record is available third approach can be if there are no regional records even at a your site of interest or any other site having similar seismic activity this is possible because many a times ground motion recording instruments are also not available so in such case one can solely depend upon synthetic ground motion or ground motion simulation take into account the source propagation path characteristics of the current medium in which ground response analysis has to be done or any particular region where similar kind of propagation path characteristics as well as source characteristics have been quantified in the uh, literature so you can refer to such papers and there are again ground motion synthetic ground motion generation models so one can refer to those can quantify the bedrock motion again when we say about motions one has to be very clear when we are talking about motion whether this particular motion is recorded at bedrock the motion is recorded at the ground surface the motion is recorded at the outcrop 
where the motion has been recorded. Because if you are taking that motion as site specific motion and further utilizing in ground motion, ground response analysis, one has to ensure that the motion itself which you are using as input motion should also not be recorded at ground surface, should not be recorded at outcrop because outcrop motion will have different values in comparison to bedrock motion. Similarly, surface motion even at the soil side will have different amplitude in comparison to bedrock motion. So, if you take those motions as directly as bedrock motion and do ground response analysis, again the quantified surface motion will not be a realistic value. Hence, one is the ground motion which has to be used as input motion while performing ground response analysis. Second is where that particular motion has been recorded. If the motion is at bedrock, then it is fine. If the motion is at outcrop, you have to change that motion characteristics to bedrock condition. If the motion is recorded at the ground surface, again you have to change the characteristics such that this is a modified ground motion, which now I will be using as input motion. And once I knew the characteristics of that motion record, I have modified it. So, now the motion which I am going to use for ground response analysis is actually indicating the characteristics of motion at the bedrock itself. So, that is why these important terminologies come into picture that will help in understanding where the motion has been recorded and subsequently modification is needed or not in these motions before you start utilizing this motion in ground response analysis. So, first one is you can see over here depending upon the lithology, it is quite possible that the bedrock is located at certain depth beneath the soil medium. Then there is free surface on which you are going to construct a building and then at times the bedrock is also or the rock which is available at bedrock medium is also exposed to the surface. So, such so, so such things that means motion is there, but in order to quantify local side effect one has to understand if it is outcrop motion certainly I cannot use it, but because this is free surface motion. So, because of free surface there will be amplified amplification in the motion characteristics. Similarly, if it is bedrock motion directly you can take into account because this motion you will take into account and quantify local side effect from each of these layers. Thirdly, if it is free surface motion that means it is already the motion available at the ground surface. Remember all these things I am referring to in case there is site specific ground motion available to you. So, if motion is not available at site specific location, you can choose motion from similar seismic activity region and use over here, but one has to have an important understanding because that can affect your local side effect significantly. So, important terminologies are again you can see over here this bedrock outcrop motion and then rock outcrop motion. So, bedrock is also there, but there is no soil above it and then there is rock which is also exposed to the ground surface. Again between the two there will be change in the motion characteristics. So, important terminologies bedrock motion the motion which has been recorded at the base of the soil column or at the top of the rock. So, it is the motion which is available beneath the soil this is called as soil. So, base of the soil or top of the bedrock that particular motion is called as bedrock motion. Free surface motion that means motion which is recorded at the surface or the top of the soil. Third one is rock outcrop motion that, that is the motion recorded at the exposed rock at the ground surface and the last one is bedrock outcrop motion that means the motion recorded at the rock bedrock, but there is no effect of local soil over here and it is not the rock outcrop, but it is significantly different level at with respect to rock outcrop. So, these possible locations that means if you are talking about input motion these are the possible location in which you can find out input motions. If the if that part is not clear to you, you can take free surface amplification or refer to seismic hazard values and quantify the motion or modify the motion accordingly such that whatever you are going to get corresponding to bedrock condition, your motion should also be matching with the peak ground acceleration value corresponding to bedrock condition. 
if it is corresponding to side class A condition at outcrop, motion will be used over here, then do for deconvolution, transfer the motion to bedrock condition and then use it for ground response analysis. So, when we go with 1D ground response analysis, that means 1D linear ram, right now I am focusing on. So, 1D linear ground response analysis that means there are some assumptions that means the soil layer properties are not changing. So, it is like the soil properties do not change with respect to shear strain. Whatever initial properties you have taken into account, the properties are going to remain constant in terms of linear ground response analysis. So, we will not be bothered. In general, the soil properties change with respect to shear strain experienced by the soil, but in linear ground response analysis, we will be using same properties throughout the solution. So, consider over here there is bedrock and there is soil medium inertial forces will be generated. So, the medium is having some stiffness value which in terms of uh, in uh, terms of soil we also quantify this in terms of shear modulus and then you are having damping properties. So, collectively a soil medium through which if you consider this as bedrock medium or the medium in which there is incident uh, uh, ground motions this motions and this is your soil medium which is having some mass and stiffness properties as well as damping properties. Depending upon these properties, how much modification in the motion which will happen for this particular mass m has to be quantified. So, this is you can approximate this with respect to one soil layer. this is one soil layer and this is your bedrock motion. So, how much amplification in the soil layer at the surface will take place because of some soil which is having stiffness properties of k and damping properties of d that will be quantified in terms of local side effect. Soil is having again some value of shear modulus, some value of shear velocity, damping ratio and mass density. So, again the objective is you have input ground motion at the bedrock level. Using these properties of the soil layer, we will try to find out the transfer function taking impedance contrast of that particular soil layer with respect to bedrock layer, determine the transfer function and then taking the transfer function into account, modify the input motion, you get the output motion at the top of that particular surface of the soil. If one layer is there, you can say transfer function of the soil which is available beneath the soil uh, surface and the bedrock, determine the transfer function, multiply with respect to the input motion and you will get output motion in frequency content and then subsequently you can convert to uh, time domain. So, again bedrock there are two characteristics, one is elastic half space where you see when there is incident wave some portion of the energy wave is carrying will propagate downward and rest of the energy wave was carrying will start propagating upward and control how much will be the vibration controlling the response of the soil. And then elastic half space and rigid half space. So, rigid half space entire energy which will be incidented that will propagate towards the surface and controlling the response of each of the soil layers. So, assumptions for ground response analysis, 1D ground response analysis is based on some assumptions that the soil boundaries are horizontal, stratifications are horizontal, response of the soil are primarily because of SH waves. You remember wave is propagating like this and causing shearing in horizontal direction because of vertically propagating shear wave between the bedrock to the surface triggering SH kind of motion. Soil and bedrock are considered to be extending infinitely in horizontal direction. And soil behavior in ground response analysis, particularly the soil behavior is approximated by KV solids or Kelvin void solid. When we talk about Kelvin void solids, it is a viscoelastic model. Again, viscoelastic model we means a viscoelastic model means there is component which is coming from elastic. Uh, uh, response and a component which is coming from 
the rate of loading or the viscous uh, behavior of the medium. So, viscoelastic model again you can see two kinds, one in which one is called as Maxwell model, which generally at times it is used for modeling the polymers. In case of viscoelastic model, which you are going to use in ground response analysis, we will be using Kelvin void model. So, Maxwell model you can see both the value of stiffness or elastic material as well as the damping. These two are connected in series. However, in case of Kelvin void model, which we will be using for modeling the soil medium, the damping as well as the stiffness are connected in parallel. That means, from this particular side if there is loading, other particular side there is response. So, if this you are considering as bedrock, the other part you will consider at the top of that particular soil layer. Now, based on this particular um, uh, photo which is given over here, you can see at any particular time of loading the strain value in spring as well as in the damper will remain constant, because these two are in parallel. However, the total stresses will be the summation of stresses in elastic spring as well as in the damper. Remember, I am telling about elastic spring. So, the, the loading in the spring will remain within the elastic limit. So, same thing which I mentioned here, the total strain will be equals to the strain in the spring or strain in the damper. Total stresses will be summation of, we are talking about normal stress or shear stress, that will be the summation of stresses in the spring plus in the damper. Now, let us see the loading behavior. So, if you say in terms of spring, because it is elastic, so depending upon the time you apply loading and you remove the loading, the spring is going to experience some strain, elastic strain and then it will come back to its original position. So, this is the the loading duration between T 1 and T 2. If you go with damper, you applied some loading and after that whatever is the response or resistance damper is going to offer that will be there. The initial part will be the rate at which you are applying the loading that will govern how much will the strain energy or the resistance damper is going to offer to the external loading. So, collectively if you merge these two in parallel, which is the indication of K B solids, you are going to get this particular response. This is how the uh, with respect to time the strain will be mobilized in the K B solid. So, initially it will be linear, but after reaching particular point, even if you remove loading, it will not suddenly stop offering resistance, primarily because there is damper which is going to offer some resistance to loading and that resistance will decay with respect to time. So, transfer function which will be used throughout. So, transfer function is generally used to represent or to correlate the motion between the bedrock and uh, I mean the motion which is incident at the bedrock and the motion which will be modified motion at the top of that particular layer. So, valid only when the initial condition of strains are 0 system should be linear time invariant and satisfy the position superposition and homogeneity principle. It acts as a filter media to change the input motion to the output motion. Primarily we will be using in terms of linear ground response analysis and try finding out how much will be the modified ground motion. So, in one ground one d ground response analysis this is just an overview. So, there is an input motion which is incidented at the bedrock. This motion depending upon the characteristics of the soil layer in which it is incidented, we will try to find out firstly the fast Fourier transformation or the frequency content of this motion using fast Fourier transformation. Then multiply this with respect to the transfer function, how much is the transfer function, how we are going to quantify that I will discuss in next class. So, this is a, a, a flow chart of the solution for 1D linear ground response analysis. So, input motion is there, then transfer this motion from time domain to frequency domain, multiply this motion with respect to the transfer function, which is a function of impedance contrast of the medium through which the wave is passing. So, you will get from here FFT into transfer function, again this will be in frequency domain, 
do the inverse fast fourier transformation of this you will get in time domain which will be basically the output motion or the motion at the surface so output acceleration time history now in earlier uh, lecture that is lecture 16 i have derived this particular equation as the solution of one dimensional equation of motion for shear wave propagating through a medium that is u z i have mentioned over here that is space and t is time equals a cosine of omega t plus k z plus b cosine of omega t minus k z. Now, if you use Euler's theorem iota uh, exponential of iota theta equals cos theta plus iota sin theta. So, using this the above equation has been modified how it has been modified we will discuss in the next class. Finally, you will get the motion in this particular form that is a real part of the quantity written in the bracket plus b real part of quantity which are written in this within bracket. So, r is the real part of the complex function. Therefore, the solution of one dimensional equation of motion which we will be using ground response analysis u z comma t equals to a exponential iota omega t plus k z plus b exponential iota omega t minus k z. So, this is the equation which we will modify with respect to the previous equation derived in lecture 16, get this equation and then subsequently try to quantify the local side effect or the motion properties which are going to modify because of a particular soil layer having known values of stiffness and damping and then input motion which is again the motion corresponding to different different frequency content. So, with this we have come to the end of this particular lecture. Thank you everyone. Mm -hmm.